So first of all, I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, um, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, my name is Dr. Astral Webb, and I am the project for North American Management Project. This is the orientation webinar for community health centers serving the senior population. So we're very glad that all of you have joined us today. We truly have a wonderful group of panel um, members and speakers who will be speaking today um, in support for the new national corporate agreement to specifically address the issues on aging. So as we welcome you, um, I would like to first let you know that our presenters would be would include Captain Henry Lopez and Tiffany Smith from HRSA, Cindy Padilla from the Administration on Aging, and we are really honored to have some of our grantees um, who are located in Illinois, California, as well as Georgia. So we are looking forward to a wonderful presentation. As we are about to begin, we will go through a quick overview of HRSA's Health Center Program, the Office of Special Popul Population Health and National Corporate Agreements, as HRSA has them. Then we will go into an introduction of the training and technical services provided by the National Center for Health and the Aging under North American Management. And then we will have some highlights of some supportive services that are available through the Administration on Aging. And then our grantees will highlight some of the best practices of integrated partnerships that have worked in meeting the needs of health of seniors in the country. They will share some real life examples of successful partnerships. And then we will end with a quick overview of some upcoming activities that we will be able to provide as a national corporate agreement. I would like to now introduce um, our speakers from HRSA, Captain Henry Lopez and Tiffany Smith. Um, Tiffany and Captain Lopez, if you would please. Well, good day. Uh, thank you, Dr. Webb. I, I appreciate the uh, introduction here. I just want to welcome everybody to this webinar. I think it's an important, exciting times for the Office of Special Population Health, the Bureau of Primary Health Care in HRSA. And I'm excited because we're collaborating with the, with the Administration on Aging and Dr. Padilla on an effort to try to make it better to provide the health care needs of all those aging populations. You know, there are a special group of people, you know. Uh, I will just tell you an example is, you know, you may have a 90-year-old guy who sees his doctor and says the doctor tells him, well, Henry, what do you expect? See, because the doctor's about, uh, you're 90 years old when the man complained about his right knee, when Henry complained about his right knee. Henry replies, but doctor, my left knee is the same age as my right knee, so why does it hurt? So in that uh, vein, uh, we have to make sure that as we provide technical assistance and as we treat more and more elderly in our health centers, that we're able to have our health professionals providing the care understand the special concerns of the, of the aging population. Uh, I will now have Ms. Tiffany Smith uh, do a, a slide presentation as to the ins and outs of the Office of Special Population Health in HRSA and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. So, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Henry and Astro, Dr. Webb. Good afternoon and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Thank you for joining us on the new grantee orientation webinar. As said, my name is Tiffany Smith, and I work within the Health Resources and Services Administration's Bureau of Primary Health Care Office of Special Population Health. Today's presentation will provide a national overview, the Office of Special Population Health, Elderly Health Program Update, as well as HRSA resources. The Health Resources and Services Administration, an agency of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, reaches into every corner of America, providing an essential safety net of direct health care services used by tens of millions of Americans who are uninsured and or medically isolated. Within HRSA, the Bureau of Primary Health Care administers the Health Center Program, which provides grant funding and other support to community-responsive and patient-driven organizations that provide comprehensive, culturally competent, quality primary health care to a broad, diverse population regardless of their ability to pay. This slide here talks about the Health Center Program Overview um, and the source is the Uniform Data System 2010. As you know, health centers are community-based and patient-directed organizations that serve populations with limited access to health care. These include low-income patients, the uninsured, those limited English proficiency, migrant and seasonal farm workers, individuals and families experiencing homelessness, 
and those living in public housing. Health centers serve a variety of underserved and vulnerable populations, including people of all ages. 32% of patients in 2010 were children age 17 and younger, and 7% were 65 or older, people without health insurance. Nearly 4 in 10 health center patients were without health insurance then. People of all races and ethnicities in 2010 Overall, 62% of health center patients were racial or ethnic, ethnic minorities. The National Center Program National Presence. HRSA-funded health centers as a whole now constitute one of the largest primary care networks in the country, a true national presence. This is the organizational structure of the Bureau of Primary Health Care, the Office of the Administrator of the Associate Administrator, which is Jim McCray, and Ms. Cheryl Damas is the Deputy Associate Administrator. We have five offices within uh, the Bureau of Primary Health Care and five divisions. Elderly Health is housed within the Office of Special Population Health. The Office of Special Population Health, which is directed by Captain Henry Lopez, and our Operations Director is Dr. Paul Wong. We focus on national cooperative agreements for special and disadvantaged populations, the National Advisory Council for Migrant and Seasonal Farm Workers, Special Populations Program Assistance, Department, Agency, and Bureau-level initiatives, work groups for minority and special populations. Within the office, we have two branches, the Health Services Branch and the Health Systems Branch. The Health Systems Branch focuses on the delivery of primary health care services to special and disadvantaged populations, which include elderly health, homeless individuals and families, residents of public housing, children, and other vulnerable populations. We also oversee and manage national co cooperative agreements that provide training and technical assistance to these populations. We coordinate activities focused on primary health care, eliminating health disparities, and improvement of the health status of the nation's underserved population. We also advise the Bureau of Primary Health Care of the needs and special circumstances of the special and disadvantaged population and ensure that they are addressed in programs and policies. HRSA is committed to assisting and providing technical assistance to strengthen health center operations. To assist HRSA-funded health center grantees in increasing access to comprehensive, culturally competent, quality primary care health care services, the HRSA Bureau of Primary Health Care has developed a number of partnerships with state, regional, and national organizations to provide training and technical assistance in fiscal and program management, operational and administrative support, as well as program development and analysis. North American Management is the training and technical assistance provider for the health and the aging or elderly health. As you can see, um, some of the updates include the one-day annual conference, which will be held this April, April 30th, 2012, in Alexandria, Virginia. North American Management is also collaborating with the Administration on Aging to execute, execute their work plan. They are also developing a 2012 calendar of events to highlight dates for future webinars and other information, and the website is available, as you can see, and we will also provide that information to you in a separate communication. The North American Management um, Health and the Aging is directed by Dr. Astra Webb, and here is her contact information. You can contact Dr. Webb and her team for any needs that you may have as it relates to this population. And again, HRSA supports all of the grantees um, in any way possible, and we, again, appreciate all of North American's work as well as the new partnerships that we are forming with the Administration on Aging and other federal partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Lopez and Tiffany Smith, for that wonderful presentation and great overview of HRSA. We are now going to tell you a little more about our National Corporate Agreement. The Health and the Aging National Corporate Agreement is managed by North American Management. In September 2011, North American Management commenced the Health and the Aging Project through a training and technical assistance grant awarded by the Department of Health and, he Health and Human Services. Health Resources and Services Administration, Bureau of Primary Health Care, in order to aid health centers increase their capacity to serve the aging population. Our main target audience include all federally qualified health centers authorized under Section 330E, 330G, 
330H and 330I of the U.S. Public Health Service Act and FQHC lookalikes through the Health and Aging National Corporate Agreement with North American Management. One of the things that is very vital for us in order to do what provide the necessary training and technical assistance for all of the HRSA grantees is to collaborate at many different levels. We know currently in the United States there are approximately 78 million individuals who fall in the aging population. We have about roughly 3,800 community health centers who are funded by HRSA um, who can provide some form of health care delivery with those senior populations. So in order to strengthen the work that you are doing as a community health center, we are collaborating with several at several levels. First of all, with our federal agency partners. You've already heard from HRSA, and you will soon hear from, on, from the Administration on Aging, which has always been, uh, has been a dynamic asset to this national corporate agreement. We are also in collaboration with SAMHSA, CMS, CDC, and the Department of Education. At the state and national levels, we are also collaborating with many organizations, including some of the leading organizations on aging issues. And these include the National Council on Aging, the Nas National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, the National Association of States for Aging and Disability, and many, many others across the country who are doing phenomenal work in the, um, with the aging population. And again, naturally for us, what's more very important is to have collaborations with our fellow HRSA national corporate agreements. This is important not only because there are many diverse special populations, but it is also an opportunity for us to strengthen our resources within HRSA to continue to provide training and technical assistance. We also collaborate with many academic and research organizations who also support um, senior initiatives, community-based and faith-based organizations so that we can work on more on the local level and work with directly with seniors, and then our provider groups, health systems, and payers, which are important in making sure that our health centers are reimbursed for the services they provide. Some of our areas of focus um, for this corporate agreement include many different areas. Um, we do want to focus on strengthening and clinical management as well as improve quality for the health centers. So we're going to focus a lot on healthy aging practices, chronic disease management and chronic disease self-management of patients, um, issues such as heart disease, stroke, and obesity prevention, pain management and injury prevention, which are include some of the highest issues that we have for seniors right now. Um, also, healthy weight, nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle interventions. Oral health, hearing loss, vision loss, especially age-related eye diseases. And then the behavioral health issues, mental health, and substance abuse services. We're going to uh, be a resource for Alzheimer's disease as well as Parkinson's disease. Then on the prevention front, we're going to look at issues and, such as STD prevention, HIV and AIDS, pneumonia and flu vaccinations, shingle awareness, and rural health outreach. And then to further assist you as HRSA grantees, we will also work on areas of improving your performance. So patient-centered medical home, which we believe is the ideal model in reaching and better serving the healthcare needs of seniors, and also um, health information technology and meaningful use. It is very important for us to be able to, in, in reaching the aging population, to address all the special populations um, and to make sure that health center staff are culturally competent as well as culturally sensitive to the senior population. So we talk about the aging migrants, the American Indians and Alaska Natives, public housing residents, individuals experiencing homelessness, and the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals who are all part of the great, of the special populations. Each approach is different, and our community health centers have to usually come up with very innovative models in terms of reaching these populations. So as we go through the next three years, you, there will be many opportunities for training and technical assistance in all of our focal areas. 
some of the activities that we will be able to do as a national cooperative agreement to assist all of our HRSA grantees is to provide remote on-site and one-on-one -on -one training and technical assistance and peer monitor monitoring, as well as helping all of your new HRSA grantees um, who need assistance in reaching the senior population. We will also develop many protocols and tools that will be useful for you, but again, with an emphasis on health literacy, cultural competency, and outreach to seniors. We have a number of online services. Um, many of our resources, tools, um, et cetera, will be found on our website, The Health and the Aging, and this you can find at www.healthandtheaging.org. In addition, we will have a series of webinars and, um, just like this one, which will be archived also on our website and will be able to provide further training and technical assistance for you. We will be doing a number of publications, which will include monographs, fact sheets, success stories, presentations, and we have monthly e-newsletters that we send out to all of our grantees. So we really encourage you to go to our website and sign on to our mailing list so that you would receive our e-newsletters. This way you will have an idea of any of the initiatives that are going on with aging, any resources that we have, any dates of webinars and conferences that could continue to support your needs. Um, and again, we will have an annual aging conference which is slated for April 30th, 2012 here in Alexandria, Virginia. In order to provide you the necessary training and technical assistance, um, you have the opportunity to request assistance, and we ask you to visit our website. This is a, slide, a shot of the page that you would find. It is a link for training and technical assistance, and we ask you to fill out the form, and a staff member will respond within a 48-hour period. Please note that there is no cost associated with training and technical assistance. If you give, share your contact information on this area and you select the areas that you would need assistance in, uh, we will do our best to send you to resources that will be most uh, cost-effective for you. What I would like to do is uh, ask our grantees to share some of their experiences and best practices in working and serving the senior population. So I would like to begin first and invite um, Ms. Karen Williams, who's the Program Director at West End Medical Centers, um, to first join us and present on the work, wonderful work that they are doing. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Yes, hi, good afternoon everyone. It's really a delight to share um, about our services that we're doing in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, a little bit of background um, about who we are and the services that we provide. Um, West End Medical Centers is a federally qualified health center. We are both the 330E and the 330I um, public housing primary care program. Um, we have been providing care in an urban setting for 35 years, with 20 of those years um, providing direct on-site care to public housing residents. Uh, we serve a population of about um, service area of 46,000 plus, with a little over 7,000 um, being from public housing. Housing. And of that population, roughly around 8%, if we look at our public housing um, target, roughly about 8% of the 7,000 um, public housing residents are um, seniors. And we provide care in family dwellings where there's a percent of, of um, seniors that live there as well as two very distinct senior high-rise that are on site in public housing communities that are dedicated to seniors um, only. Um, we operate with two housing authorities. Actually, there are three that we work with, but for the um, senior high-rise, there are two different um, housing authorities that we work very closely and partner with to provide um, care. Um, to seniors that live in those um, senior high-rise. Um, we provide direct primary care um, through either um, nurse practitioner or a physician assistant um, with MD oversight. Um, we also provide ancillary or supportive services um, through outreach, um, and very, very important is our community health worker um, system, which is the liaison between the clinical team as well as um, 
the um, residents that live there and the management. Um, and then, of course, there are we have several collaborative partners that we work with for ongoing services, um, from our county uh, services on aging to Georgia um, Department of Aging, um, as well as some universities that are in our area that help to provide services um, for those that have been indicated um, by our seniors. Um, when we talk about the programs that we offer um, to our residents, we uh, initially um, start off with a community survey um, where we actually get an input um, from the residents that live on site as to what type of services in addition to um, the traditional um, treatment of care, uh, primary care, but what other type of services um, are they most interested in. And we prioritize that based on their priority of when they would like to have have um, that information. Um, we have what we call monthly um, health topics where we bring in speakers from various um, um, with various expertise around. And of those surveys, it may range from depression um, to podiatry, um, other specialty care, um, really a myriad of different services that are most unique and that each community is very different. So each community offers um, um, suggestions on what is unique to that community. So we um, fit those needs with um, seeking out experts in those areas that can come in. In. And it has often led to long going, on, ongoing um, partnerships, um, for instance, um, with behavioral health. Um, that seemed to have been a, a very large um, um, request, and we have since established ongoing partnership with community behavioral health centers um, where we integrate the primary care and behavioral health for the residents um, that we're seeing. Um, we also have um, health assessments where we often may do um, in their apartment if they're unable to come down to the medical center. Um, health assessments range from either just an observance, um, how their well-being is, to actually um, taking vitals uh, and then referring that back um, to the medical clinic that's on site. Um, we also work very closely and, and is really paramount with the site management that's there. Oftentimes there are um, events or services that are offered through the housing authority or that site, that property manager, that will coincide with some of the services that we're offering. So in order to, um, I guess, to maximize the services and not have any duplication, we work very well and, and meet on a monthly basis um, with the resident associations um, to talk about the services, additional needs that they are. And it, it can range from transportation to specialty care. Um, it may range from um, home homebound services services, um, to even just um, um, outings, such as to the library um, if a film is being shown. So there's a, um, a, a very closely woven um, community of partners um, that the primary care works with to meet the and address the, the whole person of the seniors that we're um, providing care to. Um, and then, of course, um, our faith community. Um, oftentimes, um, many of the residents um, that we provide care to um, have churches that have adopted a particular co um, community. So we work closely with them um, from services that they may have on site, whether it's a Bible study, whether it's um, um, going and, and outing, um, transportation is needed to a particular church. But we work very closely with every organization that has a hand in or an arm in um, the community for the seniors that we're trying to reach and provide care to. Um, and it, it may even um, mean that we may not be their primary care, their primary provider. Um, in our area, there is a public hospital that some of our seniors um, were actually born in and will continue to go to. But we act as a um, liaison to provide care, whether it's chronic disease management management um, that we're providing as they continue to seek out care uh, with a specialist somewhere else. But we're really that safety net um, for them in an um, environment that's easily accessible to them um, in their home or in their, um, their community that's um, very familiar with them. And through that, over the years, and it's, it's been 20 years now that we've been providing care um, to our seniors, um, and even in um, the, the phase that we're going through with redevelopment of properties and so forth, we have still maintained um, close relationships with many of our seniors, um, regardless 
piece of what that community changes into. Um, and, and I can only attribute that because there has been a relationship or a trust factor that's been built over the years and the partners that we um, work with as well. Um, I do have contact information, so should there be any information um, perhaps that I've glossed over that may need a little more, feel free to contact me um, or Dr. Webb um, with any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now I would like to introduce Mr. Dale Fiedler, um, for, who will also give a presentation on his work at his program in Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Fiedler. Well, thank you, Dr. Webb, uh, for the opportunity to share information about our Seniors IQ program. Uh, with me today is also Felicia Jackson, who is really the spark plug of our program, and as you will hear from her in a, in a little bit, uh, you'll, you'll kind of see why. Um, our Seniors IQ program uh, is improving the quality of independence. Next slide. Our, our purpose here today is uh, is to provide one example of a senior program, and this is a model that works in our community. Uh, your community may be very different and would have a different model. Uh, we will uh, uh, touch on some of the items that we use to design our program, uh, provide an overview, and hopefully some of the information that we present will provide you with some best practices that will work in your community. Uh, we'll also uh, discuss uh, some su sustainability options. Southern Illinois Healthcare Foundation is the name of our community health center. We are a community health center. We uh, uh, are not a foundation, as most people would think of a foundation. It was just sort of a misnomer when we were uh, uh, organized and, and, and formed. But we're a, a we're a community health center established in 1985. And as is typical, uh, and in the graph uh, from the HRSA folks uh, this, uh, earlier in the presentation, about 7% of our patients are um, elderly patients. And it's really a small proportion. And, and to me, uh, as our population ages and the demographics change, uh, it becomes critically important for health centers to strategically think about how to serve this growing segment of the uh, population. And I really commend the Bureau for uh, and, and North American Management for uh, taking uh, this initiative and helping us as health centers uh, uh, begin to focus on the senior population. Um, our Seniors IQ program uh, started in, in 2006, and I would like to say that it was uh, just our response to being very aware of uh, issues in the community, but it really was not. Uh, quite honestly, uh, we responded to a, a local foundation's uh, RFP, uh, and their, their RFP was uh, how to keep seniors living independently. And to, in, in response to that, we took into account the social determinants of health, and, and that's just such a uh, important part of what we feel is, is important part of our program. Uh, we also took into uh, account the consortiums and uh, networks of uh, uh, entities that we were involved with um, as already uh, in the community. Uh, additionally, we uh, also, as community health centers, we also uh, know the importance of uh, informing our board members and getting input uh, from them uh, in this. Um, Social determinants. Uh, there's a lot of the whole body of literature uh, from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, CDC, um, and, and others uh, around this. It is just so important to understand that the you know, education, housing, poverty, race, all these factors need to be taken into uh, consideration in the design of the program. You'll see uh, some of our uh, the, the social determinants uh, in our community. We uh, basically, uh, I can. Uh, uh, look out our window and uh, see the uh, Gateway uh, Arch. Uh, many of you who are baseball fans uh, saw a good little bit of the uh, St. Louis Arch uh, in, in uh, this past fall during the World Series. So that's our location uh, uh, in the country, and we are located, however, not in the, the downtown area of St. Louis. We are on the Illinois side and in a very low-income um, community. Um, and 
this is just a sample, uh, kind of a sample growth chart, and really what the, the, the real key part here is um, from the beginning of, of 2006 to uh, uh, 2008, our number of participants in our Seniors IQ program uh, uh, tripled, and that was really, it really was a period of about 18 months. And um, uh, the, the reason for those um, um, participant numbers tripling was really because of Felicia Jackson, who is uh, here and is going to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, some of the um, Seniors IQ program activities. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, basically, on the services provided, this is very key. In the Seniors IQ program, we give seniors a voice in stating what their needs are and advocating for them to obtain these services that was requested. In this slide, you can see there are several things that we provide for the seniors, such as the certified enrollment to SHIP and CHAT, which is Seniors Health Assistance Program, Senior Health Insurance Program, which is very important to the seniors in uh, obtaining the best Medicare a plan for them and also the best prescription drug plan, which is the circuit breaker in Illinois CARES. And also, uh, seniors will always focus on keeping their homes and staying in their homes independently. So energy assistance and for the summer and winter really helps them financially to be able to maintain their home. Um, and as you can see, we continue to provide several, several um, services to seniors. Um, it continues on the, the next slide. Um, this is very important as well, initiating events for seniors where they naturally congregate in the community um, and, and including the partners, um, organizing health initiatives in the community that includes multiple agencies that offer an array of services at the location where the seniors congregate or reside has proven to be very successful in the Seniors IQ program. Some of the services that's offered are listed on this slide. Referrals for homemaker services, Referrals for a home medical equipment, shower bench, high raised toilet seats. These are just really, really essential uh, items and services for seniors to be able to maintain living independently in their own home. And the Seniors IQ program just not doesn't want to just focus on keeping seniors in their home. We really look at the quality of life that the seniors have. That's why we assist them with scheduling their doctor's appointment. And uh, Southern Illinois Healthcare Foundation um, has a transportation program here that really helps the Seniors IQ program with arranging their uh, doctor's appointments, getting to and from. That is, that's very important in maintaining the seniors' independence. And, and the Seniors IQ program, we really try to become a one-stop shop service for seniors. Having the seniors to receive services at one location proven to be very important in having seniors to return to your program for continued services. Creating an enrollment process where the seniors can come to your organization uh, in person or over the phone. Also having a verbal uh, assessment as well has been proven to be very successful for us because a lot of the seniors are not able to come out into the community. We work with a lot of homebound seniors and seniors that do not have access to transportation. So we uh, try to make the Seniors IQ program more convenient and easy to access for the seniors in this community. Um, so again, Follow-up, that's just essential and very, very important to this, to this program. Making sure all referrals, services initiated have an end result, hopefully positive. Seniors feel that they have more control over their own health and wellness if you include them in the plan of action, the plan of care. And they become more open with you in regards to their own personal needs and health and wellness. And as we know, as we age, we probably become a little bit more private. So having seniors to be more open in explaining to you what their needs are has proven to be very, very important to this program. And being able to offer them these particular type of services has um, given them that reason to open up to us because they receive services that is really, really vital to their health and wellness. Community partnerships. Um, that's very important as well. It is a very uh, key point um, in this particular program, educating seniors on the different uh, services and organizations out there that provide different senior programming for them. This empowers the seniors to become more involved, again, with their own health and wellness. The more education and uh, involvement that we can have the seniors to be in, in their own uh, path to health has proven to be very successful in creating this program. 
Um, some of the uh, examples of partnerships that we have made is with AARP. They have a senior employment program that employs seniors to come out to your program to work and assist with whatever programming that you have. And that proved to be very important because it's seniors working with seniors. And when seniors see other seniors receiving services and have a positive demeanor and have received health care or what have you, that uh, encouraged them to be more open to receive these services that we're providing through the Seniors IQ program. I think I want to just uh, begin to summarize the whole thing here, and, and it's really the, the, the best practices is, is, is value, and this is value from the perspective of the seniors. And the seniors, they're, they're not concerned about encounter numbers and healthcare system bottom lines or anything like that. They're concerned about keeping the heat on, having food on the table, uh, basic, basic needs, you know, that, that old Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. And if that is where your seniors are, and it, that's where you have to have your, your, your services and your programs. And one of the, where the social determinants tie into this is, is you may have noticed on one of our earlier slides, we, we, in our community we have a very high Ill, illiteracy rate. And the communication that Felicia described, it's, it's just so important to the seniors to have somebody who cares about them and takes the time to explain things and, and helps them to make some sense out of uh, EOBs and Medi Medicare forms and all the various plans. Uh, that was really the thing that was the value for uh, the, the value for those participants. Um, and I think what that what it also does is underline uh, the other key to success and, and best practice, which I don't have on the on the slide, is the uh, importance of staff. The, the, the right kind of staff is is, is just so so important. Um, in regards to sustainability, I think probably the first thing that we need to think about is, is trying to stay lean and, and uh, utilizing the uh, AARP workers is, is one way to do that. Uh, the current staffing uh, uh, that we have is uh, one full-time person, one part-time person, one uh, AARP worker uh, part-time, and one part-time volunteer. Um, one of the uh, uh, issues there, one of the things that just came up uh, uh, in the past year has been an alignment with a medical legal partnership. Uh, and uh, medical legal partnership is a nationwide effort on the part of legal services to align with health services and address, uh, in, in ours in particular, uh, it's, uh, they, they and us are both very interested in addressing uh, disability determinations, uh, elder abuse, as well as other uh, uh, issues. So medical legal partnership might be something, if you're thinking about uh, uh, establishing a program, you might want to look into uh, an alignment with your local uh, uh, legal services uh, group. Um, you also, it's, it's also important to document your accomplishments. Uh, you, you just you need to do that. Um, that goes a long way to uh, sustaining uh, the funding from the, in our case, uh, the, the, the private foundation uh, yet. Uh, another approach that you might think about is uh, to approach your local uh, hospitals. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, hospitals have an increased interest uh, these days in demonstrating their community benefit in order to preserve their not-for-profit status. Uh, so if you're thinking about a program, uh, you may want to, may want to uh, approach them along that lines of, uh, uh, approach them for support along those lines of uh, uh, benefiting their, in, uh, increasing their community benefit and being able to show that. Um, the other uh, trend or factor that I guess I'm kind of envisioning or seeing is that uh, as healthcare reform and care coordination become more important, entities that can leverage community resources to assist in discharge planning should really be having an increasing value in uh, today's uh, healthcare marketplace. And that is really the end of uh, our presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to Zara Masalian, who is the President and CEO of La Maestra Community Health Centers. Thank you for joining us, Zara. Well, thank you so much. This is absolutely great. For once, it's, it's really cool to be able to share 
some um, models that we've had to develop, um, I think, you know, out of necessity, especially here in California, San Diego, close to the border. I'm sure you've all heard about, you know, the funding that continues to be cut in anything to do with uh, health care or basically any program for anybody that's in need, which, of course, includes the seniors. Um, and so we've had to really scramble especially recently, um, to continue providing services with partners, um, finding funds, donations, so forth. But uh, the partnerships is really essential, and it's very wonderful to hear um, the other grantees talk and, and, and share their experiences and how much they value that uh, partnership and how it really takes you a long way. So if I were a uh, Starting out as a new grantee, I would say definitely community, collaborative, partnerships, that is it. That is the key in building um, your assets, your resources for those populations that are especially vulnerable. So um, I just wanted to say a minute. Uh, I know we only have two slides on La Maestra. We've been uh, a community health center, um, designated uh, public housing and uh, an E. Uh, for, I don't know, since 1998, we've been um, providing medical services as a community clinic since 1990. Before that, we started out as a edu nonprofit educational um, center in San Diego, uh, providing amnesty services, um, English second language, civics history, computer literacy, job training. So we've worked with uh, uh, different, different sectors of the um, service field out there for the community. So, for example, you know, we've got uh, contacts in the education field, in the uh, job reentry, job development fields, and the housing. And so that really helps us along as we are forming these partnerships that don't necessarily always have to do with healthcare providers, even though it really contributes to the well-being of that population, like the seniors, for example, that we're talking about. So here, La Maestra has very diverse cultures. We have about 30 different languages. They used to say 20, forget it, it's 30 now. Um, this is our areas where we have health centers are very impacted with refugees and immigrants uh, because, of course, they're very low-income areas that um, they can find uh, rent uh, very cheap. Uh, they have ethnic stores. They're, they have other community uh, you know, folks that, that, that you know, they, they can uh, socialize with and, of course, um, find their way here in America easier than, let's say, you know, Minnesota somewhere that maybe they, you know, they, they don't have um, other people from their culture there. Uh, seniors, I think, <clears throat> you know, the public housing in uh, San Diego, we stopped as a city building public housing um, long time ago. And so when um, La Maestra first became a public housing grantee, it's because of the public housing slash low income housing designation, entire neighborhood. Um, however, there are some structures that are left. They're very decrepit, decaying. The, um, the, the conditions are horrible. The neighborhoods are bad. The only new buildings are for seniors, low income seniors. And so La Maestra does contract and, and work um, through MOUs with the managers of these buildings, who surprisingly have never put together any kind of, you know, mental health, behavioral health, uh, medical service. They're not interested in it. What they're interested in doing is contracting with other providers, and most of their residents there are ambulatory. In fact, it's a requirement that they have. So um, we do contract. Uh, there's one, in fact, next door. Uh, it's got 250 um, low-income senior residents. And, uh, it, you know, basically it's, it, they are bored. These people are bored, you know, uh, and it has a lot to do what we've seen with their, um, their medical conditions, their, their mental health, um, their behavioral health, and, uh, and, and what has been fantastic, aside from, of course, offering the medical and, you know, getting involved in, for example, we have a promotora uh, 
senior promotora program to offer depression and anxiety screening, going on site, um, bringing people to talk about nutrition. We have a food pantry, so we, you know, we make that available too. We've got a community garden. They can come and work in there, volunteer. But it's been most effective is to put have activities for our seniors to really become involved in life. Um, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned, uh, the previous grantee mentioned um, ARP, A-A-R-P. We have that but where the seniors can actually become active and uh, be paid for 20 hours a week, for example, and without interfering with their Social Security, is um, through, we have a program that's called Senior Employment uh, services, and it's through the department, the EDD department, uh, Employment Development Department, and um, so it's really uh, beneficial because then we can bring them in and and see, you know, what areas are they interested in becoming actively involved in in terms of the workforce or volunteering, and it's amazing. They'll come in for the food pantry. They will work in medical records. To work as greeters um, for our patients, especially because of the different languages. They help with the health education out in the community because uh, we have medically trained cultural liaison programs. Because of all of the different cultures, we have to bring people in and train them before they go out and basically spread the news about, you know, why it's important for your mammography and, you know, diabetes screening and so forth. Um, so. As much as we can get them involved in these activities, it's, it's, it's amazing how their outlook, for one, they feel like, um, you know, they feel like they have a purpose. They feel like, like they are also contributing maybe to their family. Um, they are continuing, of course, their independence. Uh, since many of our refugees and immigrants, their role in their family has really changed by being here in this, in this country. All of a sudden, they're not the ones that the family has, goes to to say, oh, you know, this is a decision, can you help me? You know, the elders had a very powerful um, uh, position uh, in, in, in the family structure and society, and here it's very different. And so if we can help them reestablish their sense of self-worth, get out into the community if that's what they want to do, um, be part of different um, activities, and that could even range with uh, working with our Generations program that helps um, teens through art. You know, there's a myriad of different activities that, you know, that one, even if you don't have those other um, uh, services, like I think one of the slides that we sent in was our Circle of Care, and it shows like different petals of, you know, groups of activities, programs that we have established over, you know, 20 some years. And, uh, and, and it's, it's really incredible to see how, um, how excited and how, uh, how much seniors do want to participate for the most part in, you know, in life. And so uh, through transportation, that's another program we partner with where they have senior volunteer drivers that will pick other seniors up and help take them to specialty visits and so forth, and even non-medical services. Um, I think uh, the other big uh, program that I wanted to say that we have found is great um, is our microcredit program um, where we have, because we do job training and job uh, development, and also helping people move their business forward that they've already started, for example, in their home, uh, many are seniors. And it's basically helping them, you know, for the first time, is, for example, establish a bank account, uh, talking about why, you know, your credit, re you know, history is important, how do you establish credit, how do you build your business, how do you, you know, all of a sudden they're active, they're out there, and they're helping other women, the very poorest women, to figure out how they can make uh, uh, income for their families, um, especially if they can't get a job or maybe their legal status is not, um, you know, there, so they can't, you know, go out and get jobs in a certain industry. Uh, and, and it just provides that other um, venue. Also, as health educators, we can send them out, for example, and for our mammography screening, let's say, um, uh, breast cancer screening, so forth. They 
they can go out to different businesses that maybe they're from. Let's say, like we have somebody who, you know, worked in a hair salon for years. They go out there, they promote amongst the health hair, hair salons, you know, why it is that the women need to come in for services and, you know, so forth. So it's just, it's, it's been incredible. And, and to see how we can continue to grow and develop innovative models by listening to the seniors and saying, okay, what were you doing? What were your skills? What are your interests? Who do you know? How can you help this program grow? And get them in there. And, and, and it's, it's just amazing how, how the resources come together and the programs roll out in a way that is effective and, and it totally increases health outcome, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, health outcome uh, measures and, and uh, basically results. So that's kind of where, um, what, what I wanted to share with you. Um, and uh, if you're ever in San Diego, come over and visit us. It's uh, really uh, a cool, um, I think, an organization that has gone beyond um, just health care, you know, in the traditional sense. I also wanted to say that, yeah, we have hospitals also interested now in partnering more because of the ACO models coming up. And so they want to get more involved in primary care because that's going to be the basis of all ACO models. So, you know, all of a sudden we have these hospitals that we're not interested at all in primary care or coming out into the communities, the low-income communities, and now oh, they're interested in primary care because that's going to be the root of the ACO model. Anyway, um, uh, gosh, we can go on forever, but I thank you so much for the opportunity to um, to be on this call and to share. And please look up our website. It's lamaya.org. Uh, www .org. And, um, and you can see other programs that we have uh, specifically for different ages. Um, they're all low income, basically, and very culturally diverse. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that presentation. Um, now you've heard from a couple of our grantees, and we would like to now, um, which first of all, I want to thank you all for sharing your work. Um, I think because of what you do in your very communities and the movement that you have, um, it motivates us as a national corporate agreement to help many of other health centers who may have had uh, similar issues um, and potentially can adopt some of those programs. So we would like now to invite um, Dr. Cindy Padilla, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Administration of Aging, to present um, on the wonderful support that they have provided for this HRSA Aging Initiative. Dr. Padilla? Thank you, Dr. Webb. You know, after listening to the presentation and, and the, um, especially from the grantees, I think that it really, it might have actually been a good thing that we um, can bookend this webinar and talk about the administration on aging after because it really, I think, our presentation is just really going to reinforce a lot of the things that have been said and the great work that is being done in our communities right now and how can we at the federal government really help solidify more of those partnerships and those collaborations and take advantage of the Affordable Care Act and, and the accountable care organizations and just the initiatives now that are really looking at, you know, bridging and bringing public health, health um, to aging support services, you know, so really bridging the public health model with the human uh, services and social supports. And so um, actually following the grantees is, 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 I think, going to be very, very good. And hopefully, as I mentioned, we can reinforce the value of, of these partnerships. And I want to, um, before I start, actually really thank um, HRSA and Dr. Wakefield and Marsha Brand for really initiating the partnership um, with AOA, but mostly I want to thank Captain Lopez and Tiffany Smith because it really is going to take, you know, us working collaboratively so that, you know, we're breaking down silos within government, we're putting people together and saying, you know, what programs are we doing, what are you doing, and how can we work best together? So I really appreciate the opportunity, and we at AOA appreciate uh, the opportunity to work with HRSA and, and this initiative and, and this cooperative agreement, and Dr. Webb, your leadership in putting together the cooperative agreement. And, you know, really starting with an orientation and, you know, moving progressively along throughout the year with other opportunities to educate each other 
about our networks. I mean, that's really what we want to do. The most important thing is to bring the public health network, your network through um, HRSA, together with the Aging Services Network. So we really um, think that this partnership is going to um, really help strengthen the services in the communities. And we hope for you all as grantees that you'll be able to that we might be able to help facilitate some of those connections. And so I want to talk just a little bit about, and I'll go through my slides. I know it's been kind of a long afternoon um, rather quickly, but I think we might, hopefully we'll have some time for questions. But the uh, Older Americans Act is really our primary piece of legislation, which was signed in 1965 and um, as part of the Great Society legislation. And so I think it was very important um, to know that, you know, the Older Americans Act has been around for uh, over 45 years. And, um, you know, it's up for uh, reauthorization every five years. And now, or this, now in 2011, 2012, you know, we're looking at another reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. And so the services and the programs that were outlined in the Aging Network, outlined in the Older Americans Act, um, was actually started in 1965. And if you know, also in 1965, there were two other small programs, no, I mean large programs, Medicare and Medicaid, also came into being in 1965. And I think at that time, you know, we really realized that the states and communities um, needed to move toward a coordinated program of services and opportunities, and President Johnson said it best in the signing and putting these programs together. And I think now um, we continue to have that promise through the Affordable Care Act and the other opportunities that are continuing to um, to take place um, now as we move forward in this coordination and, and bringing states and communities and government together. The mission of the uh, Administration on Aging is really, and we've heard this throughout the, um, your presentations before, is to develop this and to help facilitate the comprehensive, coordinated, cost-effective system of home and community-based services so that we really keep people in their homes, which is what we've been heard, you know, talking about all afternoon and listening to from the, the grantees. And I mean, we want to, people want to stay at home. And so the Older Americans Act and our mission through AOA, the Administration on Aging, is really to um, serve that purpose so that we really do help keeping people and elderly individuals and people with disabilities in their homes and their communities. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, real quickly, um, Older Americans Act is our primary. Uh, enabling legislation, but we also operate some programs under the Public Health Service Act, uh, Medicare Improvements for Patients and Providers Act, some of you know that as MIPA, um, Chronic Disease, and uh, the Affordable Care Act, as I mentioned before. The, uh, I want to go through the um, Older Americans Act just real quickly in terms of the uh, declaration in Title I is really, really the heart of the Older Americans Act. And as I mentioned, we talk about keeping people in their homes. Um, in the Older Americans Act, you know, this, these declarations are, are front and center. And they're really looking at an adequate and common retirement and helping people maintain their best possible, you know, their physical and mental health and looking at housing and long-term care services. Um, employment opportunities, civic engagement, retirement, um, being able to retire, you know, with honor and dignity and be able to stay engaged with your uh, community and having a continuing, um, continuum of care for the vulnerable elderly so that we really connect people in our communities, again, as we have talked about with care and support services. And we want, we work with the National Institute of Aging and we do benefits of research. And it's really a bottom line is looking at freedom and independence for our older and vulnerable populations. The key provisions of the Older Americans Act, as I mentioned, and um, I'll go through quickly. Title I, I talked about as the uh, previous objectives um, in the previous slide. Title II is really the administration on aging and who we are. But Title III um, is where we start with what are our programs. And so we have grants to state and community programs for supportive services and senior centers. Um, congregate nutrition services, home delivered nutrition services, disease prevention and health promotion, national family caregiver support programs. So our Title III grants for state community programs are, are pretty comprehensive and, and we work um, very closely with our states and our area agencies on aging, which I'll explain in a moment. Title IV of the Older Americans Act is, um, really focuses on training, research, 
and uh, discretionary projects. So we're looking at you know best practices and 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 evidence evidence based um, disease uh, prevention and health promotion programs. Um, Title Five, and we heard a little bit about that earlier. When I think one of your programs is the Senior Community Service um, Employment Program. Again, in helping to keep lower income um, adults uh, employed, we work with the Department of Labor with that program. And we also have a Title VI, which is our grants for Native Americans. And our Title VI programs include the same delivery of ser- supportive services as under Title III, including nutrition and caregiving, um, as we mentioned, and all of the other supportive services. And so we work very d- directly with our, our federal, federally recognized tribes and uh, consortiums throughout the country. And Title VII includes um, the um, elder rights protection and long-term care ombudsman, the prevention of elder abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And, you know, we talked to, heard earlier about the partnering with legal assistance. Well, Title VII is also support to the state legal assistance developer program. The next slide, when I want to talk about how do we deliver these services, and when we talk about the most important part of this initiative, as I mentioned early on, is connecting the public health network, um, the community center, community health center network with the aging services network. And so this slide gives you an understanding of what our network looks like. And this is really, as I said, the key to this partnership because it's at the top um, is administration on aging. And we're actually a very small box in this um, pyramid because we are a very small agency. Um, but we work very closely with 56 state units, 600 uh, state units on aging or state departments, um, 629 area agencies on aging, and 246 tribal organizations. So our reach starts there with the states and the area agencies on aging and the tribal organizations. And so we provide grant funding and technical assistance and program to um, this particular part of the, uh, the aging network. Well, the aging network, the area agencies on aging, the tribal organizations, then you see have over 20,000 service providers and rely heavily on volunteers. So when you look at the the breadth and the reach of the aging network, um, it really is through the service providers and the volunteers. So our reach goes, you know, out into the uh, the country, across the country, through the state units and the area agencies on aging. And this is um, just um, a little bit of some of the services that we also that we provide or provided through these um, um, through the aging network. You know, we talked about meal, uh, meals, we talked about transportation, personal care, um, caregivers, case management and uh, respite care, and, of course, our ombudsman um, consultation. So we have a variety of, of programs. The next slide, um, Julie, is kind of what probably nothing new to all of you, um, but it really kind of talks about and why the importance and, and, and the relevance of our two programs really, you know, combining and working in the community is the aging of the population. So if you look at the first graph, our 60 and older population in the United States is projected to increase 55% um, in the next in 40 years. Um, and the most rapid growth um, has already begun in 2010 and 2011. As a matter of fact, right now, as of 2011, uh, 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day. So we know that this population, our population of the United States, the uh, baby boomers are aging and moving into this, um, this category. And if you look at the second um, graph, the 85 and over population is also projected to increase. And we're looking at a 27% increase from the years 2015 to 2030. So when we look at just the aging of the population and we see these numbers across the country, we know that we need to really look at uh, the Aging Services Network, the um, HRSA Network, and CMS, all of the agencies and organizations so that we can work together to address the needs that are going to be, um, that we're realizing right now. Um, and the Aging Network Challenge, you know, I'm just, again, this just kind of reiterates the, um, the aging population and, and the growing need for services. And so when we think about what keeps all of us up, you know, at night and what we're thinking is that we know that this population is is growing. The next slide, or my last slide, is just to kind of give you a a quick summary and reiterate maybe some of the programs that we had talked about before. But we also, under the Older Americans Act, um, our programs focus on the home and community-based services, as I mentioned. 
which includes uh, nutrition, transportation, home care, evidence-based disease prevention, health promotion, support for uh, caregivers, information and referral, respite care. So, I mean, a variety of programs that are being available at the community level through the area agencies on aging and providers. We also work with our states and our area agencies on aging with uh, managing aging and disability resource centers. And we talked or heard earlier about the importance of care transitions and, and those activities and how can we um, help um, seniors, people living with disabilities, really, you know, navigate the system and find out about long-term care and, and what do they, um, what's available, what resources are available to them and, and how can we help manage, um, help them manage their health care and their services. Um, we're also working with the uh, Veterans Affairs Department on a veterans-directed home and community-based service program um, on consumer direction and really looking at patient-centered direction so that the patient as a veteran participating in this program can utilize these services through the aging network, but they're the ones that are controlling and saying, these are the services that I need, and we're connecting them with the services that are available. We also have an Alzheimer's Disease Supportive Services Program um, that working very closely on the National um, Alzheimer's uh, Plan right now and um, a call center, a national call center for Alzheimer's disease, again, information um, referral for this particular um, disease. We also have a Senior Medicare Patrol Program, which we call SMP, and it really is designed to help fight fraud and abuse in, in Medicare, where we enlist the utilization of volunteers and actually seniors, and we talk about peer-to-peer -peer counseling and peer-to-peer -peer motivation, and our SMP program is really about that. And again, being in the communities, getting seniors to help other seniors understand their Medicare programs and looking at their Medicare summary notice, their MSN, and saying, you know, making sure that they keep on track of the expenses and so that they do not become victims of fraud and or abuse. And the um, Administration on Aging is also uh, supporting and helping with the Elder Justice Act and the protection, as I mentioned earlier, against um, elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And um, I know I went through um, these slides um, fairly quickly, but what I wanted to do was to give you what we wanted to do at the Administration on Aging was, you know, not just talk about the fact that we're supportive of this partnership, because we definitely are, but we wanted to show you and let you all know and, and get to know that you help you learn a little bit more about our network and how can we help facilitate that those partnerships at the community level. And we want to also learn more, and we're working with our area agencies on aging, to learn more about your network and, and the federally qualified health centers and how can we help facilitate those partnerships and um, those collaborations at, at the community level. Um, I come from the state of New Mexico. I'm a former state director, but I also worked at a local government and the city. And, you know, I think that we all know that the people are in the communities. I mean, that's where the people live. And, you know, a lot goes on west of Washington, D.C. Um, and um, that's really where our programs need to be, and we need to help um, all of you with your programs and connecting our network so that we really do facilitate um, these partnerships and, of course, facilitate, bottom line, the best service that we can to um, American seniors. So. Again, I want to thank um, Hersa and um, Captain Lopez, Tiffany Smith, and, and Dr. Webb for putting together this um, webinar and um, really look forward to working with all of you in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Padillo, for that presentation. I think it is rewarding to know that there are services that are available for seniors at the community level um, that can really support the work that our HRSA grantees are doing um, in better meeting the health care needs of seniors. Um, during this time, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in. But during the presentation of our grantees, at the particular time Karen Williams was speaking, there was a question from Victor Kirk, and the question is, are you finding that seniors have a tendency to access specialty, specialty services rather than primary care services? If so, what is your strategy to move them toward utilization of primary care services? I would like to, first of all, ask Karen Williams if she would respond, and then um, 
Zara, Dale, um, if you, oh, Felicia, if any of you would like to comment further on what you're doing at your health center, we would appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. Excellent. Excellent question. Um, many of the seniors um, do have uh, specialty care um, needs um, and oftentimes um, um, find themselves seeking that specialty care initially. And what we've tried to do is more of an education process and being there, um, whether it's from medication interactions, um, whether it's um, chair exercise, just whatever the education piece may be, that leaves an, an open door um, for the primary care provider that's there on site to direct um, the needs of specialty care. Um, and and that seemingly has worked very well because, as I mentioned early on, it's really about a trust factor regardless of um, what that specialty um, need may be. Once there's an established relationship, an established trust factor, then residents are more apt to come in to either see the nurse or to see the provider that's there to address those issues so that they can get a referral um, if indeed specialty um, services is required. Um, but but it's a mere fact that many of our seniors um, um, do need a lot of specialty care. But oftentimes um, that can be redirected um, just by mere um, um, the education process and, and involving other partners to come in and address um, some of the needs that may be perceived um, by the residents and patients that we have. Um, but it's worked out well, and, and, and I would say the, the crux of that has been um, through outreach and um, uh, the relationship that's been built through the education process that our providers even do uh, in-home visits or um, there, right there in the um, lobby area. So it, 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 it can be thwarted. It, it can um, be redirected so that there's not a, uh, an onslaught um, directly to, um, you know, n n the um, nephrologist or, or wherever it may be. But that primary care um, provider that's on site has, has really come to be known as the gatekeeper, um, even with questions um, where to go and how to. Um, I hope that answered a bit. Great. Thank you, Karen. Do we have any other mm -hmm, comments sure. from the other grantees? Sure. This is Zara Marcellian. Um, from La Maestra, you know, I think uh, the points that uh, you just made were fantastic. The more the support staff in terms of our senior care team uh, can, can interact with the seniors and, of course, with our other patients, too, because this is our medical home. But, you know, they, they can take a lot of that uh, time that, they, that the providers would and uh, with, let's say, the seniors, if they want to just go directly, let's say, to a specialist because they're convinced that way, it's a lot in the health education or just sitting down and talking to them. And a lot of that can be done um, by the support staff, the nurse, um, the triage nurse, so forth. Of course, you know, the doctor is there. Um, they, they, can, they can access the primary care. And, yes, they have lots of, you know, chronic disease, um, coexisting conditions and so forth, but still, um, I think that uh, it's it's more effective if we have more people on that team that they can talk to and can keep track of them, that know about their case management, that know uh, about those seniors, and they've developed a relationship. Because a lot of times it's just, um, you know, the the patients are worried. You know, they think, God, oh, you know, I'm, I'm must be really sick here or something. You know, and I need to go straight to the you know, whatever, like you said, a nephrologist or something. And um, so I think that uh, more more time is spent explaining, talking, listening, reassuring, uh, redirecting, um, educating. And then um, the other thing I wanted to say is we are trying to expand our telemedicine so that we'll have more access to specialty care providers for seniors and others, especially those that are self-pay. Um, and... It's, it's just going to be, I think, a wonderful addition to our senior um, program uh, so that those specialists, I mean, we don't have to send our seniors clear across town uh, and, you know, the issue of more specialty becoming, you know, less available uh, is, 
and transportation and translation and, and cultural, you know, competency and so forth. So that's one of the programs that we're going to expand and use in our senior uh, center. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Um, I think we have, um, Dale, did you all want to comment also? Oh, no, okay. I, think my, I think my other two colleagues uh, really uh, uh, described it well. We do some similar some similar kinds of things, and it's a really it really is about that ongoing uh, education. Thank Excellent, you. thank you. We have another question coming in from okay. Megan Morton, and the question is, how does an FQHC deal with the liability insurance for volunteers if they would like to provide transportation to and from doctors? Uh, sure. Um, if, if I may offer this, um, as an alternative um, to volunteers um, themselves um, driving our patients, um, we offer um, transportation services um, either in the form of tokens or um, there's monies available to go to specialty care that we've set aside. Um, we don't actually um, have um, coverage um, for any volunteers to drive. Um, we have some transportation services at our center, um, uh, but not for taking patients from one location to the other. Um, perhaps um, we've, we've just chosen this as an alternative. This is Zara from Lamaias. Uh, one of the things that's helped us is if um, the managed care plans that we contract with, oftentimes they have um, specific benefits for their members, like uh, tokens for the taxis, for the shuttles, for the bus um, passes, and um, and that's that's cool. Uh, I think our insurance is covered for the um, for anybody, any services like you know transportation, uh, any volunteers, any student interns, any of that is covered under a program that's called NorCal, N O R C A L. I don't know if it's specifically for California. But it is definitely insurance that covers everything else that um, you know that's not covered under FTCA, for example. Great. Um, um, Megan um, actually made a comment and said that they're very rural and have no public transport or taxis in their area. Um, and I'm wondering, Dr. Padilla, too, um, you can feel free to add if there are any services that maybe through the area agencies um, that they may also be able to access. Um, yeah, you were actually kind of talking about it a little bit over here, and uh, a lot of when it, as far as transportation for um, volunteers, and um, we're going to see probably a lot of uh, differences, like we've heard from your grantees as well, you know, at the local area agency on aging. I mean, they may do it differently. They might have a blanket coverage. They might have, um, you know, different kinds of um, systems set up. But there's a community transportation association that um, you can probably go online and look, and they might have some information um, about, you know, specific um, questions if you all have specifically, or or also if you're in a particular, wherever the question came from, from a particular community, if you wanted to um, email me or us at AOA, we could connect you with your local area agency on aging and see, you know, find out locally how they're doing it. So, you know, we can help make some connections that way. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have a question coming in from Victor Kirk. Um, his comment was that Medicare is asking that we promote the use of primary care services. How well have we done overall? If the grantees would like to comment on that. Uh, this is Zara from Lamaisa. Commenting on, on how well we've done overall in terms of, uh, of Medicare yeah, reimbursement. For, for well, Medicare reimbursement. Um, Medicare reimbursement continues to be, um, you know, pretty low in terms of, you know, what what services we do provide for that, you know, individual visit or, you know, all of the components that go in, the cost factor. But um, I think overall, uh, you know, we we definitely have have done better in terms of. Um, you know, the patient sent a medical home, that initiative and implementing that model, and, and the seniors, of course, benefiting from that because, you know, the, the, the basic centers in each one of our, you know, whether it's peds or seniors or adolescents or family practice, um, 
OBGYN, you know, the care team is there, that model is there, and so I think by virtue of that, they are accessing more primary care, and more of their health issues are handled through primary care. Thank you, Sarah. Well, what we will do, um, in, first of all, I, I do, again, want to thank all of our presenters, Captain Lopez and Tiffany Smith from HRSA, Dr. Cindy Padilla from Administration on Aging, um, our, who are our supportive uh, federal partners, and uh, again, our HRSA grantees, Karen Williams, Dale Fiedler, Felicia Jackson, and Zara Masalian. Um, I know we are uh, close to the end of our two and a half hours, but we did want to um, just share some upcoming events. First of all, please be, know that we are um, currently going to be doing a needs assessment for community health centers that are serving the aging population, and we will be releasing that soon this winter. Um, so please look, for, look out for it and respond to it. This information that you provide for us is very helpful to not only provide the training and technical assistance that you need, but also for us to identify any barriers and challenges that you may have, as well as your best practices and successes in dealing with the senior populations. Secondly, we would also like to let you know that our first annual National Primary Care Conference on Aging is scheduled for April 30th this year at the Westin Hotel in Alexandria, Virginia. The registration will begin on January 20th, and so you can visit us online at www.healthandtheaging.org to register for details. Um, Again, we thank everyone for joining us for this webinar. We hope that the information shared has been very helpful to you and know that these are the potential partners and resources that can help with the success of your outreach to seniors. We look forward to working with all of you. Please do not hesitate to contact us if you need training, technical assistance in any way, and if you have any questions, um, again, thank you all.